Okay, uh, good evening everyone. Um, welcome to join our master talk today from DesignWire. Um, this is our uh, 12th talk um, from the beginning. And today we are very honored to have Mr. Pe uh, Peter Eisenman uh, to our talk. Uh, so Mr. Peter Eisenman, he's a, a famous and great thinker and educator. And as an architect, he's so famous that every architecture student knows about him. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> and he's also been granted the uh, Lifetime Achievement Award by uh, Venus uh, BNL. And also his um, a Holocaust Memorial uh, has shaken the world and triggered the thinking all over the world. And also, uh, Today, we have more than 100 people from uh, chi uh, Chinese developers and um, lots of architecture uh, professionals uh, is joined in our audience. So uh, the Design Wire uh, Master Talk program is um, to focusing on the um, most famous masters all over the world. Uh, we had um, Amen's uh, founder, Adrian uh, Daka, and Yabu Pushaberg, Thomas Hethervik, and Kengo Kuma, uh, Vini Mas, and Bill Bensley, and some other masters. So today, uh, we are very honored to have Peter Eisenman here in our live talk. Let's welcome him again. Thank you. Okay, so let's start our uh, talk. Okay. Great. So, uh, Mr. Uh, Eisenman, we, we all know you are doing architecture as your uh, like profession for so many decades. Um, architecture is very important to you. So, could you uh, talk to us what architecture means to you? Yes. Well, first of all, uh, um, when I was a young boy, I liked to draw and make models, but I never knew you could go to university and study architecture. So I got to my university, Cornell University, and I was studying chemistry, uh, which my father was a chemist. So I studied what my father studied. And uh, I hated chemistry and I didn't like it at all. And the, the, the mentor, the, the counselor uh, in the housing dormitory was architect, uh, older architect student. And I saw he was making models and drawings. And I said, you can go to university to make models and drawings? He said, yes. So I said, I want to do that. I never knew architect at all. So I went into architecture and um, I thought at the time that design, like uh, if you read, there was a book uh, called The Fountainhead and a famous movie with Gregory Peck. Uh, and it had a man by the name of Howard Rourke. And Howard Rourke was a, a, a designing architect, a sort of hero figure. And I said, I want to be like Howard Rourke. This is the only idea I had to be a design architect. And uh, I went to, to university. I was in uh, American Army. Uh, I came out, I got my architecture license. And uh, I won a scholarship to go to Europe. And in Europe, uh, I realized there was a different idea about architecture than merely design, in that you could be a successful architect by thinking about ideas and incorporating ideas into uh, design. And so what happened was I, I went to University of Cambridge, a very famous British university, and I wrote a thesis called The Formal Basis of Modern Architecture, which was published in a book and it's been translated into Chinese. Uh, it's a very interesting book. 
and this changed my whole idea of architecture. So that to me, architecture is a philosophic, cultural idea, not just satisfying uh, housing or office space, etc. And I try and do uh, buildings which are icons. That is, they stand out from every other kind of building. In other words, when I was in China, I saw thousands of high-rise towers, uh, but with no architecture, just building. And what I believe we need are within these thousands of, of high-rise towers, we need one, two, three pieces of architecture to establish the culture of architecture. And we cannot lose that. And if you look at the history of China, the great uh, treasures uh, of, of China are the historic icons that are different than the thousands of towers that are being built. And so the kind of work that I do and the kind of work that I teach is about making buildings that resist consumption uh, um, in, in a way. And I believe this will happen in China as well as the United States and Europe. I think there are the three poles of the world today is Europe, US, China. And I think that each one has to develop an architecture that is indigenous, let's say. It comes from the history of the place. And so I believe whether it's Chinese students or uh, French student or American students, we have to study our history. And so um, I'm, I, I'm teaching the theoretical history of American uh, building. And uh, what I'm trying to do is to open up these kinds of ideas because we have many Chinese students to understand that. The problem today, then I finish, is that we are no longer uh, in, the, in the spirit of uh, democracy and capital, and et cetera, that the paradigm, what I would call the paradigm of late capital is leaving the, the world and a new paradigm is coming. Um, and you see it in China, you see it in, in uh, Europe, you see it in places in the United States. That paradigm is going to need a voice in a new architecture. And so modern architecture is an old paradigm, neoclassical architecture, old paradigm. And so the 17th, 18th, 19th, 20th century are no longer valid for today. And what we need to do as architects, as developers, is to find what is the way of making architecture relevant in the culture uh, other than just building thousands of high-rise towers. So that's where my head is, my thinking, and um, I think it's a very important time to think about change. Okay, yeah, so it's very glad to uh, hear you talk about the uh, change and also the close relationship between architecture and culture. Um, so uh, when you talk about architecture uh, and also you talk about the changing of architecture, um, could you share with us who has the most influences on you uh, for your um, architecture uh, philosophies? Well, um, most, what I believe you have to do that I teach and that I practice myself in order to understand how to change, you have to go back to a period of time when the architecture that we have today uh, first happened. Um, and I believe that happened in the 15th century in Italy. And uh, so I teach uh, Italian architects like Bramante, Alberti, 
Raphael, Michelangelo, etc. That's what I teach and look at. I'm doing a book right now on Alberti, uh, who did a very major work in the 15th century, um, which had to do with what we still think of as cultural architecture. That is uh, part to whole relationship, uh, scale relationship, etc. And so what I've told my students and tell architects is we need to go back to Alberti and Brunelleschi, the start of perspective, uh, Bramante, the start of organism, where things today, which are today relevant, uh, began so that we know how, when to begin, uh, how we can get rid of those things and begin again. And so my students need to know how to begin again. And that's what I teach. So like how to start over. Right. The culture, first of all, culture in China has to start over too, because uh, it cannot just be, because the, look at the difference in the government uh, in the 21st century, as opposed to the 20th century or 19th century. So contemporary China, has even more of a problem because the government is radically different. The power is radically different than it was two centuries ago uh, when you had the different dynasties. We don't have a dynasty now, we have a government. And so we have to go back to the dynasty to find out the kind of, of, of uh, cultural architecture that happened in the Ming Dynasty or Tang Dynasty, and uh, how we can change the architecture today. Uh, and so uh, our history is no longer valid. So you understand what I'm saying? So the Chinese, for example, have two problems, young Chinese architects, First of all, they have to understand the difference between the dynastic cultural idea, the chi idea of Chinese landscape that was in the 18th, 19th century, number one. Number two, what they have to understand is there was a 40 year period between 1945 and 1999, let's say, when China was completely cut off from the West. And so therefore, uh, to understand the architecture, the, the cultural architecture of the West uh, today, many Chinese architects don't have that experience that we had when we were part of uh, a new, new beginning, let's say after Second World War. So the Chinese, young Chinese have two things. One, to understand the difference between two centuries ago and also the period of architecture that they missed. That's a 50 year period uh, when the regime was the revolution, okay? Mm -hmm. And so that's a, a, a very difficult thing for Chinese, young Chinese architects, but it's important that they understand that. Okay, so you mentioned about a special uh, time period in China uh, that uh, about 60 years. Um, yes. Yes. So, um, and we all know in that in that time actually is the uh, modernism um, start to uh, you know uh, uh, correct. Spreading. Yes. Yes. So, and we all but know. But they didn't have any history of that. You see, they were cut off completely by government, and uh -huh. so now China is open. They have to understand that fifty-year period. Yes. Yes, so that 50 years period is very important to uh, actually architecture history. Yes, very. And so we have in that uh, time period, we have uh, structuralism and deconstructionism. Right. For you, uh, we know you uh, at your early, um, like your early professional um, times, you were structuralism. So we call mm -hmm. And That's correct. You shifting to the deconstruction. Right. Yeah. So uh, for that uh, changing, uh, could you share us 
what factors uh, impact you most uh, about that change? Well, what the change is very important to understand is that um, Western thought was always based on the idea that origin was uh, a value uh, in itself. In other words, where things began had value. And <clears throat> uh, deconstructivism said, no, there's no value to beginning. Uh, beginning is just the same as no beginning. Um, and so this, this is uh, a really important. The second thing is in architecture, there's a very interesting relationship between a column, a wall, uh, a roof, uh, a building, and its meaning. We look at a building and we see a meaning. Um, so uh, what the construction said was there's no one-to-one -one relationship between a wall, a column, and a meaning. It's a variable, uh, what they call undecidable. And that's a new idea of meaning in architecture. In other words, you have to build something that has meaning not readily known. When you see uh, the work that I do, we, we can talk about the fact that I try to have undecidable meaning in architecture. And so that's a difficult idea. <coughs> and uh, we cannot use old symbols because old symbols are a one-to-one -one relationship between the sign uh, and the thing. And so what I practiced and what deconstruction philosophically told me was there's no one-to-one -one relationship between sign and thing. But that's done, that's over. Now we, we have a new situation, no longer in late capital, et cetera. Uh, and we need to think again what is the relationship between building and meaning? Uh, and that's a really important idea for the audience, for students, for everybody. Um, how do we get meaning from what we build? And then we have another problem today. We have environmental problems. Uh, in other words, how do we deal with environmental problems? Uh, how do we deal with uh, problems of, of uh, colonialism. In other words, everybody is saying now that Western architecture is colonial architecture. And so we now need to be thinking about post-colonial also for China. Uh, they cannot, because they colonized Korea, colonized Japan, let's say, uh, they, as Japan wanted to colonize China. Uh, and so we have to get over this idea of colonial thinking and uh, United States, Britain, all of the country, Russia, China have to get over this. And that means new meanings new and new signs, new vocabulary. And uh, so we are in, we're moving into what I would consider post-colonial uh, period for China, for Russia, for US, for Europe, etc. We have to be post-colonial. No longer can we have racism, and this is a big problem in our country uh, right now. So we're all facing uh, social, economic, environmental problems different than <coughs> in the 18th century. These weren't problems in the 18th century. So um, it's a really exciting time if you're interested in things, in things changing. And I find that the students, the young students are really interested in change. Uh, and so teaching is very difficult because you can no longer just teach uh, what you were teaching 50 years ago when I first started teaching. Uh, you have to start thinking differently and you can't do architecture the same way. My early work is very different than the work I'm doing uh, today. If we don't think again, we will be culturally irrelevant 
And that's a terrible thing to say about any era, uh, that it's culturally irrelevant historically. So we have to do, be conscious that doing architecture is not just putting bricks on top of bricks and steel on top of steel and, and uh, apartment on top of apartment and office on top of apartment. It's something that we have to think again. <coughs> and I'm interested in that. Uh, so very exciting time. Yeah, so think, uh, to think again actually is, uh, is uh, uh, like a main point for yes. changing right and changing yes. actually is a uh, like a philosophy yes okay. yes so um actually when we talk about philosophy we always talk about resistance so it's yes. like resistance is a mainstay uh topic uh in philosophy and also in your architectural uh theories so um uh can you share with us uh, why do you uh uh, why do you express the practice of resistance in architecture? Very simply, late capitalism, the, the sort of era that we are in, late capitalism, depended upon uh, an economic model of consumption, uh, production and consumption. You have to keep producing to keep consuming. It was a vicious cycle. That cycle is coming to an end uh, and um, what architecture was in this period of production and consumption was made easy for people to consume in other words oh like a new car every year we got a new car a new look in a car so this was the same thing with uh, housing we get a new look in housing so you can't have something old you got to have something new, something exciting. That idea means that architecture, like automobiles, like television sets, has to be consumable. That is easy. And what I believe is in order to be culturally relevant, you cannot just be consumable and easy. You have to be resistant to the era of, cons of late capital. Um, and if you're not resistant, it'll run over you. And so I very strongly believe that we need to uh, rethink uh, consumption in terms of architecture, both in terms of, of uh, how things look, how things behave environmentally, and uh, we can, we easy, things to consume are environmentally a problem. So we have to have things that are resistant to consumption in order to obey uh, environmental concerns. And so that's a very clear reason uh, that we cannot continue uh, consumption and production. Mm -hmm. So resistance can keep you sensitive and uh, yeah. care about uh, like everything else. Yeah, it, no. Resistance help you to think about environment. You can't just <coughs> plant trees on buildings uh, like some architects are doing uh, to say you're dealing with environment. It, and you cannot just have solar panels. You got to really rethink the the basis of of, of making things. Uh, in terms of environment. So it's um, a very difficult idea. Uh, and also in terms of, of making objects, because objects to be easy had to be simple. They looked one way, etc. But when in deconstruction, for example, when you say uh, undecidable, that means not able to understand what it is that you're looking at that's a resistant object. So um, there are all sorts of these ideas that interact, that architecture is very important. And when I say architecture, I mean urban planning, urban design, uh, problems of, of uh, 
multiple. And when you have multiples, you can't just do easy. Let's say I need a thousand housing units, so I'll make them all the same easy. No, maybe we have to make a thousand which are different. And now computation has allowed us to do uh, multiples uh, as different rather than multiples as the same. And several architects are being able to understand this and uh, <coughs> we can see it in places like Abu Dhabi where there's very interesting new architecture. Uh, new uh, social and political entity, A Abu Dhabi a hundred years ago was a desert. Uh, now it has really interesting architecture. So we have to do the same thing that we're doing in Abu Dhabi, in Beijing, in New York, uh, in Moscow, etc. We have to try for new resistant things that are not easily uh, consumable. And that should be understood clearly uh, by Chinese architects uh, because the regime was always against consumption. The, the, the Chinese government was uh, very much a Maoist uh, government was against easy consumption. So it's an interesting problem, especially for China. That's why I enjoy speaking to a Chinese audience because they have the most difficult problem, let's say, uh, <coughs> since they, they're not dealing with uh, capitalist democracy as a, a discipline in economics. They're dealing with a, a Maoist discipline, uh, which is very different and is always resistant to capital. So US uh, has to develop a resistance to capital. Chinese uh, already have resistance to, to capital. Uh, there will be another idea of resistance in uh, China. So very difficult. Uh, you cannot just say what we do in US is good for Chinese. It's not. Um, and uh, what we need more is an understanding of Chinese, their own culture, rather than the culture of the West. Uh, and that's uh, a difficult problem. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So there's no one size fits all. No, <laughs> not one size. Thank you. <laughs> that would be easy and we want difficult so one side size feeds nobody <laughs> exactly it's nobody <laughs> Easier. so uh let's talk about your uh projects okay well i have uh i'm, I'm going to show you three projects um Erdem, you're going to push the the no. You would like to talk about the Holocaust uh, Memorial first. Yeah, the memorial first. Yeah. We were in an invited competition, and you see the picture of the site from above, and we wanted something that was difficult symbolically. We didn't want the usual idea of, of gas chamber or death or anything. And so we made a field of, 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 of stones, uh, and uh, 2,500 stones, <coughs> and um, you can see what it looks like. It looks different than any of the buildings around, and that was the whole idea that it would look different and feel different as the experience of a concentration camp was uh, very different, but we didn't want to make it look like a concentration camp. So we built this field and you can see next, yeah, uh, the colors show the depth of the, the field as it undulates from the surface down. And the orange you see in the middle uh, are the deepest areas and the blue and the red and then eventually to the green and the, the brown color at the edge. Next. And this is what the ground look like. In other words, we didn't want a stable ground. Uh, and so there's, you can see the size of the, of the pillars um, <clears throat> made of uh, smooth, very smooth concrete. Next. 
and you can see what it was like with the trees uh, and the field. Next. And there it is. Uh, the model is very similar to the picture. And what's interesting is the people go down and come out and you never know because it's always uh, sloping. So it looks very simple, but <coughs> when you're walking, you can uh, get lost. Uh, and if you don't hold on to your child, it's very difficult um, to find him or her. Mm -hmm. And what I'm saying is that there's a picture of the, the up close. Uh, it has no meaning. Uh, uh, they're not gravestones. They're not caskets. They're not uh, monuments. They're, there's nothing on them. They say nothing. And so it's just a field of absence, basically, a field of silence. And that's what we thought was necessary for the project. <coughs> um, and you see, there's a difference when you're walking uh, perpendicular to the screen as opposed to parallel. Parallel, there's, a, there's uh, there are rectangles rather than squares, so that there's a different feeling walking across the site as, a, as opposed to being parallel. Next. And you can see the difference in the scale of the slabs. On the uh, right side is a low slab that you sit on, and then uh, on the left are very tall uh, pillars. Next. <coughs> Next. And the shadow is uh, very important, uh, and the, the feel of the concrete uh, um, is, is very interesting because it's constantly changing from uh, above your head to below, uh, around your feet. Next. Next. There's the Parliament building that uh, Norman Foster won the competition for the glass dome and it shows it in proximity uh, to the field which is very important that you go from the seat of power to this and next the important thing about this slide is that i wanted people to be able to walk on them to have lunch on them uh, to be every day in other words the idea was to bring the memorial not uh, something apart from every day but uh, in everyday life. And you can see this what young kids love uh, with their scooters and roller skates uh, walking on the pillars. Next. This is a very wonderful slide where you can see a person jumping uh, and uh, the relationship to the pillars. Next. And then they, there's a, a museum uh, part of it, which uh, takes the form of, the, of uh, the pillars above. You can see the grid and it reflects on the floor. Next. And about the lives of the people who were murdered in the camps. So, <clears throat> There's something next project. It's a condominium housing project in Milan, Italy, uh, that we did uh, just finished last month. Uh, next. Oh, yeah, you can see it. It's the gray building in the near foreground. You can see the scale of the existing neighborhood. And we wanted to provide something that fit in, but also was different. We wanted to study the Milan typology of, of, how, of, of multiple housing units. Next, please. Uh, and here is a building. Uh, we believe that when we are looking to today, we should look back as well as forward. This is a building by a man by the name of Giovanni Muzio, it was done in 1922 at the beginning of the Italian fascist revolution. And it's a layered building, a different stone. You can see a tripartite, the light gray, the dark gray, and the white uh, in the layers of the building. 
and uh, the curved facade. And um, to us, this was uh, a typology of a tripartite base uh, piano nobile and attic story, which was part of the Milan uh, housing idea. Next. And you can see the building as it turns the corner uh, and uh, has a very uh, interesting uh, idea of how it frames and creates uh, public space. Next. And here's uh, the building we did. And you can see there's a stone base, which is a Roman travertine base. Uh, there's a piano nobile, which is set back, uh, terrace unit set back. And then there's the attic story of two and three uh, duplex uh, condominium of two floors or three floors. Uh, <clears throat> and this has been very popular uh, in uh, the, uh, the, the selling of the condominium units. And you can see it has both modern, the idea of the grid uh, in the project, uh, as well as stone. And so it has both the uh, stone of history uh, and it has the grid, the steel uh, structure uh, exposed of the uh, contemporary architecture. So it combines both. It's not one style or another. It is two different, or at least two different ideas. Next, please. And you can see the backside is different than the front. Um, the backside has the steel in in indented into uh, the stone. Uh, you can see it goes in and then on the front side, so that front and back is also an idea of Western architecture. Next, please. Uh, and this was an existing building that we had to keep, so we were able to build over it, but you can see that the structure of the old uh, late 19th century building, <clears throat> early 20th century, uh, fits right into uh, our building. Next. And here's a good view of it. The You can see in the center of the screen the existing building and then the uh, Piano Nobile, uh, the indentation, the grid coming forward on the forward side, so revealing itself and uh, the stone base, and then the attic story of the duplex uh, units. Next. And the garden across the street that connects to the garden uh, in front of the building. Every apartment, what it does environmentally, every apartment has through ventilation, uh, <clears throat> that is windows on either side that are operable. So no need for air conditioning. Uh, and each, every apartment has a balcony uh, so that you can be in the open air <clears throat> as well as indoors in the climate. Next. And you can see the balconies uh, and the duplex units on the, on the top and how the grid steps forward uh, on the inboard uh, or front side. Next. 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 These were taken uh, from a drone, which is a whole new idea of thinking about uh, with these drones taking photographs, you can look down on buildings like this uh, and it becomes part of the design process. Uh, and so the, you can see the organization of the building uh, from above, uh, which is something you couldn't do before. And is a really interesting shot uh, from the drone uh, of the project. The last project I want to show, so I show a memorial, a housing project, 
and a cultural project which includes uh, four buildings in the Galicia region of Spain, an uh, important cultural site. And here was a model uh, of the building that we turned in. It was uh, six buildings at the time. Um, and it was to make it look like a hillside so that the building was, was not a building, but carved out of this passageway. And you can see the fingers of people being able to walk through. <coughs> it's a very, <coughs> excuse me, famous pilgrimage site uh, where uh, the pilgrims come from France all the way through the border in uh, the Pyrenees and end up in uh, Santiago, the patron saint of uh, the area, uh, Iago being St. James. Um, and so this was a passage through a building rather than a building in itself. Next. And then we figured out using computation, the various different grids uh, to include different scales in the project. Uh, this was important. And you can see the roots. This was a landscape drawing that we made, the roots in brown, the parking in the green, and the yellow being the, the buildings. Uh, and it was on a hill that you walked through uh, from uh, the east uh, to the west to the cathedral down below on the left-hand side of the drawing. And you can see it in the landscape of the city. You see the cathedral in the foreground. Uh, you see our project uh, in the left middle ground. And then you see the kind of hills. And we were thinking of this kind of idea so that our building would look like uh, a, a, a hill uh, in its, its outline, but something different very much so in the uh, material it was built of stone and steel. Uh, there you see another and uh, stone, steel and glass. Uh, and the particular building you're seeing on the left is a, an administration building on the right, uh, a museum. There was a library, a cultural center uh, uh, in the four buildings. And the whole idea was to build an, a complex of cultural being that people would come as tourism to uh, Santiago other than uh, religious pilgrims, so that there would be a cultural and lay focus and secular focus uh, on doing this project. Next, please. You can see the roofscape um, with the uh, grid of the city etched in different color stones. These are all local stone. <coughs> Uh, and uh, it's very uh, uh, environmentally uh, cautious because the roof is about uh, three meters deep uh, to give you an insulating layer uh, on the whole project. So again, uh, there's a, an idea of an environmental impact, which is very important in the project. Next. And you can see the different kinds of stone in the foreground, one to this building in the middle ground and then the far ground, three different kinds of stone textures, rough, smooth, color difference, scale difference. So we were working with uh, using uh, a various material structure. Next. And you can see one of the wall pathways walking uh, through uh, the project. So you can either go through or uh, go into the buildings. Next. So we see you, you, uh, you are using different materials for this project, like di different stones and glass and um, right. metal. Yes. Yes, uh, is this different materials uh, means something to you, like um, important meanings? Well, I never used to use local materials. So the whole idea was to, that we were 
saying, as you can see, that this was part of the landscape and that the buildings on the exterior didn't look like buildings. They looked like uh, stone mounds, let's say. And so it was very important to have the idea that it was perhaps uh, a mountain, but then you have the grid on it, which said it was man-made. So there's this play between the natural and the man-made. Uh, and that's very important to have the undecidable uh, meaning. So uh, what does it look like? Uh, does it look like a library? No. Well, what does it look like? It doesn't look like anything. And this was the whole idea. Uh, and people love walking up the slope uh, and rolling down. I mean, kids go up and down on the, on the slope of the library. Um, it's uh, uh, really an exciting project. To be able to do four buildings at the same time, I think it's every ar architect's desire to do something more than the isolated building. Next. And you can see uh, the forms of the outside come through on the inside. There are three different levels. The, ar the, the stacks, uh, the archive, the reading rooms, uh, lecture halls. Uh, so it's a, a, a multi-purpose and multi-form uh, environment. Next. And you can see straight lines against curved lines, glass, blue light against yellow light, uh, stone material against plaster. Uh, there, there are always this uh, doubling of uh, ideas, uh, tension between different things. This is one of my favorite uh, shots of the administration building and then the museum building in the background. Uh, next, please. Uh, okay. And that's at nighttime. And you can see the, the, the paths through lit at night. That's it, Erdem. Yeah, from this view, it really looks like a mountain. Yeah, oh wait, we gotta do the books. So also part of my work next, uh, this is a book that was published in Chinese, uh, 10 canonical buildings is a theoretical text on 10 different architects in modern architecture uh, that uh, has been widely seen in China. Next. And this is a book that just came out uh, two weeks ago uh, uh, on the idea of late and lateness. Uh, it's something that goes against the avant-garde uh, and the avant-garde is always early and before. And what we're saying is, can we do a new idea in the new uh, moment we're in about the late? And so this is a book that, a very small book, but a new idea that we're working with just came out a couple of weeks ago with my colleague Elise Turbe, and we're going to be teaching a course in Yale uh, which deals with the late. So my activity of teaching, of writing and building is what I think an architect should do and that's what this architect does and even though I'm 88 years old I, I really uh, feel that we're just beginning uh, and to feel like you were just beginning when you're 88 if the pandemic doesn't slow us down we'll be fine so thank you on the slides okay to hear this and uh, so for uh, for the lateness uh, the book you just published uh, yes. could, you, uh, could you like uh, share with us the main thesis? To what? I'm sorry, Phoebe, what did you say? Uh, could you share with us a main thesis, a thesis for this book? Uh, yeah, it's against the avant-garde. Uh, it is showing architects like in the modern movement like Adolf Loos or Aldo Rossi 
who we say were doing late work, uh, that is non-avant-garde work that was exciting. And we thought in general, culturally, it's a time to think against the avant-garde, which was uh, part of the consumption uh, of modern architecture. And so we're proposing uh, something against the avant-garde, uh, against the, the idea of future as better. Uh, and we're saying is maybe the past is better. And so this is what the book is about. It's a very small book. Uh, it's one long essay, about 100 pages. Uh, and maybe soon will be in Chinese. It just came out now in English. Wow, looking forward for the book in Chinese edition. Me too. Uh, <laughs> and we have a few questions from our audience. Okay. Uh, so the first one is, uh, Mr. Uh, Eisenman, could you talk to us which is the role of the uh, rationalist architecture today? I think there are two ideas. Um, you can have uh, experience uh, as architecture, you can have things as architecture. In other words, the people is experience versus things. Um, people's experience, I believe, is interested in personal expression, etc. The difference between personal expression and things is that things don't have any thinking, let's say, uh, they are thought. And what rationalism does is try to make things, as opposed to people, uh, meaningful uh, without dealing with emotions, subjectivism, etc. Uh, for example, much of uh, the world is about uh, populism today, and populism is something that's against uh, rationalism, but uh, we cannot go back to rationalism as it was in the before the World War. We need to think rationally differently. And uh, so, what I'm working on now is a hybrid rational, uh, not uh, uni unitary, but uh, bifurcated, let's say, or uh, not something that is monochromatic, uh, but uh, multi-directional. Uh, and that's about as best as I can explain it. Um, the old rationalism, I think, is, is no longer valid. Uh, the, old, the old modernism is no longer valid. And as they were part of the old avant-garde, they're no longer valid. So that's why I'm thinking of how can we have the rational and have it anti-avant-garde or late. Uh, and that's a new idea for the rational. So we're, we'll see. Uh, this is what I'm working on now. Thank you. And also we have a question. Uh, he asked uh, from a deconstructionist view, what is your idea about how the relationship between the core of architecture and space have an impact on human uh, perception? Whoa, <laughs> that's a difficult uh, question. First of all, I don't think the cultural view of deconstruction uh, is no longer what it was and no longer necessarily valid. What I'm thinking about is a space uh, and an understanding of space that is between the personal and the collective uh, that is no longer what I would call dialectical. So the answer to the question is a really complex philosophical answer, but basically I'm talking about the edges, uh, what is called in English liminal uh, experience, so that the, from the personal and small scale and subjective, uh, we go to the edge of that before we get to the large scale and the collective. And between the large and the small is the edge of something which philosophers today 
are calling third space. And so I'm looking for third space. And this is a, an, an idea that is, will be in China shortly, uh, I can tell you. Uh, but uh, it's something no longer rational, no longer deconstruction, no longer personal, no longer collective, something between. Uh, and uh, that's called third space. It's called hybrid space. It's called liminal space. There are many ideas for it in the work. And what we're needing to find now is not the words, but the forms that uh, give you these kinds of, of thinking. Um, and that's what we're working on in, with our students. We're working in our office on the new project in uh, Georgia, Tbilisi. So uh, I don't have the answer yet, but uh, it's very new in our thinking. And uh, maybe in 10 years we have it. Okay, that will be the last project I do, uh, but it's an exciting project. That's so inspiring. The third place is very important to architecture and also very important to people, actually. Very much so. Yeah, and also we have uh, one last question. Um, okay. From your experience in architecture, um, you had the opportunity to see so many movements uh, come and go. Uh, do you think nowadays there is a, a prevalent movement or do you think is contemporary architecture branching into different styles? I don't think there's a movement. Uh, I, I don't think we have enough of an idea about what should be. Uh, I don't think we know in our schools what we should be teaching. I don't know as building architects, what we should be building. I don't even know if we know what we should be writing uh, or talking about. Um, um, I'm saying when I will show you the Tbilisi project, it will be different than uh, Milan housing. It will be different than the cultural buildings in Santiago. It will be different than Berlin. So, I, so you say, what's it look like? And I don't know yet. I know that it won't look like it was. Uh, that's all I know. It's going to be different. So ask me the question in maybe two or three years. Uh, I have an answer. I come back and give you a, a new lecture with new buildings and new ideas. Right now, I don't think anybody has the right idea or an idea. And so we're all, it's what makes it an exciting uh, time. What I like about your little sculpture, for example, there's a rationalist cube and the wings of desire uh, to, to get rid of this heavy block and free ourselves. So I'm trying, the wings are trying to push the block away and open to a new experience. Uh, that's what I like about the, the sculpture. Uh, and that's the way we are in, with our students, our developers, our politicians, and our architects. We're uh, wanting to fly and get rid of the heavy weight that has kept us from flying. 